Hi guys, welcome back. Here we go in the third study of this journey down into Egypt. All right, let me just recap where we've been so far. In video one, I told you about the various cultures that we have in our facility at any one time. And the fact that I've got unbelievers, I've got professing believers, I've got Muslims and we've got Jews asking questions about the connection between this coronavirus, this global plague, this global infection, infestation, call it what you will, this global invasion and the scriptures. Okay. And some of them, I must admit, some of them are saying, oh, okay, yeah, what does your Bible say about this? And I've been disregarding the tone. The question is coming from the heart. You cannot judge the tone. We have to listen to the heart. And if I'm honest, I must address that issue with you guys before we go any further. Because um, whilst I am unbelievably excited about being asked these questions from all this, oh, it's just a wonderful mishmash of crazy mixed up kids. And I'm in such a privileged position to be able to turn the pages with them and say, look, this is what's going on. And then... Um, Clients are leaving, going home, asking for the same kind of lessons. So here we go. That's why we're here. If you remember me saying that in the first video, um, I also said that it was going to take more than one lesson. And this might, this could take anywhere between four or five and 3,009 to get all the pieces of the jigsaw into place so that we can see as born again, blood bought, spirit filled, baptized judeo bible believing christians wow this has been a worthwhile journey okay so um just going back to the tone i am painfully aware after i watch the videos and i have to watch the videos before i do the next one to just get my mind in line with what's been said and i'm aware that i can be very forceful you're wrong okay and i'm sorry man She's, by the time I've said it, it's too late. Um, and I'm not saying sorry because I don't believe what I'm saying. I do believe what I'm saying. But I'm sure you believe what you what you would say as well. And it's not for me to stand on your toes and poke you in the eye and tell you that you're wrong. Okay, what I'd really rather do with you, if you don't mind, is maybe we can go into the scriptures and let God speak for himself. He doesn't need me to put any emphasis on his wonderful wonderful word so please if i haven't lost you already please bear with me man um we spoke about prophetic imagery as well along the way about pictures in the scriptures in old testament scriptures that painted a picture that paints a picture of a, a prophetic event in the future and then we with regards to the coronavirus we, I went through, I promoted various questions that we're going to address. But the most important one is once we get through this, what are, what's going to change? What are we go, going to do differently? Okay, and if any older Christians are watching this, I have to say the church cannot go back to how it was before this virus kicked in. If the true church of Jesus Christ was being the true church of Jesus Christ in the earth, we would be naming it, claiming it, blaming it, healing it, sealing it, and we wouldn't be in this plight. We would still be the biggest religion in the world, the biggest faith on the planet, but we're not. We're diminishing. And I went on to say that I honestly believe we're diminishing because we've deviated from God's word. We've turned God's word into what we want it to say, more often than not so that we can accumulate for ourselves an identity from the people who come and listen to us. I'm an evangelist. Not many people want to listen to me more than once or twice. I'm not a pastor, I'm not a teacher, I'm an evangelist. If I can teach you anything in our studies, it's not because I'm a teacher. If I teach you something, that's just gonna be a byproduct. Okay, I'm gonna deliver what I am convinced to be scripture, okay? And if you are convinced in your heart that it's not, you can comment below these videos. Please put me right, man. Don't let me go sailing off down the wrong river. Okay, if you can honestly guide me into correction, I'm open, man. I'm open. I've had plenty of practice at getting it wrong. 
okay? I've had so much practice at getting it wrong. I've turned it into a positive on the whole. I turn it into, I think it was Nelson Mandela. And Nelson Mandela said, I'm never wrong. I either win or learn. So please don't let me go sailing off into the distance if you know I'm running down the right, the wrong track. I'm re-communicating to you lessons and, and concepts from within the scriptures that I've been listening to every night and every morning for over 20 years. Let's say 20 years. It's over 20 years, but let's call it 20 years. Every night I go to bed and listen to a sermon or a lesson about the about the, um, the the book of Revelation, about the book of Romans, about the book of Exodus, about the book of Nahum. And I listen to Hebrew teachers. I'm studying with the Israel Bible Center at the moment and I'm gathering Jewish insights, Hebrew insights into the Jewish Jesus absolutely unbelievable teaching and at some point i'm going to i'm going to put a list of teachers names on the screen for you so that you can start your own personal quiet time with scriptures coming out from within judaism that's where we're going into judaism we're going into exodus exodus is the cogs and wheels of judaism exodus leads us into deuteronomy and numbers and leviticus okay so um, I'm really not trying to speak off the top of my head. I almost feel like apologizing that I'm trying to maybe communicate a message to you. I've been called arrogant because of my approach. I'm not, I don't think arrogance and passion are the same thing. I googled arrogance and it says arrogance is um, harboring a belief that my belief is superior to everybody else's. That's rubbish. That's utter. I mean, the, the, um, um, description, the definition of arrogance, if that's arrogance, I've got to tell you guys, you won't find me guilty of that. When the Lord opens my heart, my heart before all to see, and you're not going to see me thinking, I thought I was better than you. You're wrong. <laughs> but then I listen to what Jesus says, you know, and he says, as we judge is as we are. So maybe, maybe some self-reflection might be a little bit better than throwing darts at the speaker. Um, so I'm not a teacher, I'm not a pastor, I'm an evangelist, I, I apologise in advance for my approach and my, my passion, please stick with me man, we're going into Egypt, we're going into Exodus, in 2002 my darling wife who's just walked in and I went to the Keswick Convention and um, the Reverend Alex Matia was speaking and I think it was 2002. I'm sure he'll correct me if, if I'm wrong. But he spoke through the book of Exodus for five nights. The most amazing journey of my lifetime. It was like, it was just, it was, wow, it was like 3D. It was like Exodus in 3D. And I was trying to take notes. And in the end, I had to put my notes down and just tune in. After the convention, I bought the CDs of the same teachings and I listened to those CDs sometimes twice a day. No, sometimes three times a day. Okay, I would listen to a teaching in bed at night through my iPod. So I would turn out the lights, get in bed, turn out the lights, pray about the message, press play and travel into Egypt with Alex Matia. Okay, and then if something particularly significant spoke to me, I would listen to it again. If I, if ever I was doing a long distance journey, Exodus is in the CD player. And then, it, 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 so I'd listen to the sermon at night. I'd listen to it again the next morning. I'd listen to it on a journey and I'd listen to something new the same night. I go into lessons like this every night and I have done and every morning and I have done since... 2000, actually before I graduated Bible college, my final year of Bible college, I lived out in the local community and I started listening to lessons. Then when I'm on my own, I'm with God and I only want to listen to God. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, we're going to go into Exodus and I'm going to me this little tramp who slept, I used to sleep in Woolworth shop doorway. I was the posh homeless one because I slept in Woolworth shop doorway. Okay, so and it's, it falls to me now to bring to you this 
some wonderful, wonderful diamonds and pearls within the book of Exodus, okay? I don't, really cannot claim glory for this. Please don't think Colin Garnett's a great preacher. Colin Garnett's an evangelist and he delivers a message. He says what he means and he means what he says, okay? I don't mind being wrong. I've done it before. We'll get through. Please correct me when you know I'm drifting. But um, what I do have to say is this book of Exodus journey is just full. It's like, you know, the calendar that you get at Christmas and you open one on a day-to-day -day basis. You stare at it all on the night before. You're looking up at the calendar and you know you can't touch it because your mum and dad are there. And then the next morning you open it and it's like, oh, wow. That's what the book of Exodus is like. That's where we're going in the book of Exodus. Okay, so little old me. I'm not trying to be a teacher. I'm trying to be an evangelist. The times are terrible. This is a good day to be evangelist. Okay, right, Egypt. Did I miss anything then? Oh, in, in the second video, I spoke about deviation from God's word. Okay, you see me deviating from God's word. Please put a red flag in my um, whatever it is you do. You know, the comments underneath. Don't let me go on my own, guys. Don't let me drift. If you think I'm drifting, please take a risk. Tell me, man. Right, we're going into Exodus. And in the book of Exodus, if we go to Exodus chapter 1, we see the birth of Moses. And you know, what we see in the birth of Moses is his mom kept him for three months. And then she had to make a basket for him and wrap him nice and warm. Maybe give him one last feed, one last wind. And she would put him into, she put him into this basket that she made and the, the bitumen that she made to seal it. Such care, such loving care to send her baby down the Nile. Okay, and lo and behold, Pharaoh's daughter pulls out the, the basket from the Nile, opens it and there's this little boy. In chapter one, that's, I'm sorry, in chapter one, we've, we, Pharaoh has made a law the f male children of the Hebrew women, kill them, throw them in the Nile. The Nile was something that the Egyptians worshipped and sacrificed to because it was their life source. Okay. Pharaoh said, these, these Hebrews are getting too many, man, they're like rabbits. Every time a woman has a male child, meet them at the birth stool, take the male child, cut the cord, drown it. Kill it and drown it if you want, but drown it in chapter one. Then in chapter two, Moses is born. And she keeps him for three months. She, she feels that baby's breath on her face. She breathes in the child's breath. And she stares at the baby because it's her baby. Just like you and I do when, we, when our babies arrive. We stare at them and we look at the We try to count their, their eyelashes. And then we see that they're going to the toilet. And it excites us. Oh, look. It's not going to be any different for the mother of Moses as it was for your mum, my mum, for you and me. This is reality, man. She seals the basket, sends it onto the Nile. That Hebrew child on that Nile was floating on a river that contained dead cousins, dead babies, dead Hebrews, dead Hebrew children. And this Pharaoh's... She didn't... There's something that we miss... Pharaoh's daughter plucks him from the Nile and didn't kill him. Why didn't she kill him? And it could not possibly be that, oh, because it's a cute little baby. It's not nothing to do with that. Good looking kid, apparently. Why didn't Pharaoh's daughter or anybody else who saw the child kill the child? He, the Lord himself inspired that his mother didn't circumcise him all the other babies have been circumcised that's what the, the Hebrews did we see later on that Moses is circumcised by his wife because God was going to kill him God was going to kill him because he wasn't carrying the sign of the covenant okay so God was in charge he was allowing his his all-seeing all-knowing presence 
prepared the uncircumcised child to enter into enemy territory and grow up so that he could flee enemy territory and lead the people into his freedom. Okay? And we're only in chapter 2. <laughs> Wonderful, isn't it? In chapter 3, God calls Moses. Moses has grown up a little bit. And God calls him and said, right, I'm going to send you into... Moses has done a runner from Egypt. I'm condensing the story. But God calls him, sends him back into Moses. Go and tell Pharaoh, let my children go. Moses starts to bottle it. And God shows him his power. God says, put your hand in your chest, throw your staff onto the ground and gives him powerful manifestations of himself. This is who I am, okay? And so we get into, we can just now flick forward to chapter 7, all right? And what we're going to see at the start of chapter 7 is prophetic imagery. We're going to see prophetic imagery, all right? It's symbolic imagery. It's typology, Okay, it's the only way you can understand what went, what took place in Egypt. It's typology. Okay, Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. And I put my glasses on so that I don't have to look down like as if I'm reading, but guess. Okay, Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. See, I'm even on the wrong page. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. What's that about? I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. Okay? So, it's Moses is instructed, told right from the off, you're going to symbolize God. You're going to be a type of God in the eyes of Pharaoh. Typology. Okay? A lot of westernized theologians kind of dismiss typology and what they replace it with is anecdotes about their auntie's cat falling out of a tree and then they turn that into a sermon outline this is biblical typology this is not it's nothing else it's biblical typology god said to moses you're going to pharaoh pharaoh the god of the world egypt symbolic of the world pharaoh symbolic of the god of the world Moses, symbolic of God. Aaron, symbolic of God's prophet or God's priest. So we've got God and Jesus, the God of the universe, and Jesus' son going before the God of the world, the anti-God, and his sorcerers, it says in the book of Egypt, in the book of Exodus. When Moses throws down his staff and it turns into a serpent, the sorcerers of Pharaoh throw down theirs and they duplicate the miracles. So we, we've got typology. We've got Moses symbolizing God, Aaron symbolizing God's high priest. Then we've got the sorcerers representing the false God, the God of the world's false prophets, false teachers. Okay, that's the typology. That's, what's, that's exactly what's taking place in Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. Right, we're going into Egypt. We're going into Egypt. We're at the gate. We've got our hand. The door is open for us to enter into Egypt. And we're heading for Exodus chapter 11, verse 1. We're going to Exodus chapter 11, verse 1. Okay, before we get to Exodus chapter 11, verse 1, we're going to look at what the what was happening within the culture of Egypt. As we sit at home, wondering what's going to happen with the plague, wondering how, how long is this going to go on, wondering wh how far is this going, is this ever going to end? That's what was happening to Egypt from Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, right through to Exodus chapter 11, verse 1. Uncertainty, fear, a cloud of depression over the world. The then known world, Egypt was the world. It was engulfed in a, in a cloud of fear and uncertainty and doubt. Families were anxious in their own homes. Parents were looking at their children. When is this going to end? It was okay for Pharaoh to kill the Hebrew children, but now it was time for the Hebrew children, the firstborn child of the, of the Pharaohs, the, of the Egyptians. The tide is turning now. And so we're going to go. I'm not going to go into every one of the plagues. 
I'm going to leave you chewing on this. I want you to I want you to listen to this again, because we're coming to some scripture in the not too, in the next clip, starting at Exodus chapter eleven verse one. It's going to be our launch pad into this promise. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back in person. And he's coming back in person to judge. And he's going to save his people. I'll see you in the next lecture, man. Lecture. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs>